Oh. You're all lovely and you can all stay. Um, hello, good afternoon. So, uh, if, if you weren't in Molly's talk uh, in the last session, you missed a fantastic talk. She was talking about uh, the Agile Manifesto and, and the difference between being Agile and doing Agile and Agile with a capital A and all those kind of things, which is great because that means that I don't need to spend the first 10 minutes of my talk doing the same thing, <coughs> although I will briefly. So I worked at ThoughtWorks um, for eight years. 2002, I joined. Uh, um, left in 2009. And while I was there, you know, these guys are pioneers of a lot of agile stuff. Uh, um, really, really uh, fun place to work. Had a great time there. And, and then I, I left there in 2009. Um, and, and this is what happened next. So, uh, um, so I came out of there thinking, I'm pretty good at software. And, and teaching software and, and coaching and doing all this agile stuff. And, and then I went off and worked with a very good friend of mine. His name is Joe Walms. Uh, he's my favorite programmer. He's the best programmer I know. I know lots of programmers. He's the best one. And the reason he's the best one is he manages to write very, very little code. OK? He writes tiny, tiny bits of code. And what he does is I look at this problem, and I go, oh, there's a problem here. And he goes, well, you see that problem? It's really just that, isn't it? And you go, how did you do that? And he says, I can make that go away with some code. And you go, oh, did it again. Right? And he's, he has this habit of being able to keep doing that. I've known Joe for, I don't know, nearly 20 years, a long time. And we were at each other's weddings. We go back a long way. And anyway, so I'm, I'm leaving ThoughtWorks. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do next? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm putting together a little team in, uh, in a trading firm in London. And do you want to come and play? And I was like, I haven't coded with Joe for years. And it's going to be great fun. So I went and coded with Joe. And it terrified me. <laughs> and it reminded me that I know nothing about software at all. Um, and so I'm in this team. There were three of us. I was the third person in the team. And, um, and these guys were doing some really unusual things. They were building, I mean, this is like full stack uh, electronic high frequency trading software. So very algorithmically, you know, so the, the, the technical complexity in there is quite deep. Um, you have uh, a user interface, which is a browser that traders are looking at, and traders need to be looking at correct information, so the UX is very, very important. Uh, um, these things are connecting to electronic trading exchanges, so lots of integration, all this kind of stuff. And these guys were able to put together these systems in weeks. Right? Things that even a good team of people in that company would take months. These guys could do this in weeks. And I was like, this is mad. And I went in there, and I joined this team, and, and basically they were doing it all wrong. Right, they weren't doing any of the Agile stuff, you know, and I said, I need to fix them, because right? they're clearly they're, they're wrong. And, and, and that was sort of one, one option I had. Another option I had was, uh, this is just a fluke. It's going to be an amazing trip just to watch these guys doing cool stuff and being part of this team, and, and it will be great. And then another part of me said, one, what if they're doing something that I could show other people? What if they, just by instinct, just because they're good at what they do, have found themselves, have happened across, have developed techniques, patterns, ways of doing stuff um, that I could show other people. And so I spent a year in this team, and uh, I had a bit of a crisis. I really, really struggled with kind of, because uh, my, my superpower is going into teams and organizations and, and making them faster, helping them move. And these guys were really fast. And I was like, I, my, my, my superpowers don't work. What am I going to do? And so, so then anyway, so that led to this, this chunk of work I've been doing over the last few years, which is, and I've realized I've basically made a 15-year career out of trying to tell people what Joe does, which is fine, because he keeps doing really cool stuff, and he finds it amusing. He doesn't go and speak at conferences. And every now and then I say, Joe, I've just noticed this thing that you do. And he goes, I guess I do. <laughs> he finds it quite amusing that I'm so fascinated by it. Anyway, so I started calling this stuff Patterns of Effective Delivery. And... Um, so Dave Thomas, who was speaking earlier, actually, I, I'm going I'm to invoke Dave. I, he, I didn't know he was going to be here, but I'm gonna, I hope he's not in the room. Oh, I'm in trouble. But no, he, he said he said a wonderful thing. Um, he, he gets quite passionate about how badly we've, we've, uh, we've uh, misunderstood Agile and the Agile movement. And he says, Agile's about getting started from zero. He says, it's been deified, diluted, and distorted. 
And I thought that was a really, really good description of what's happened. And this is, you know, this is the big A agile, this is the doing rather than being and all of that stuff. So why do I care about this? I care about um, the fact that we talk about people over process, but we end up with process over people. Okay, so new team, day one, and they get together and they say, right, so Scrum or Kanban, one or two or three week iteration, sprints, um, tooling, Jira, Confluence, da, 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 da. by the way, what's your name? Right. <laughs> right. We jump straight in with process and tools and, and we forget that there's human beings building software and that makes me sad. And then back in the 90s, in fact, when Scrum was invented, early 90s, um, Jeff Sutherland talks about hyper-performing teams. Now, a hyper-performing team in the 90s is a team that can deliver something in a season. Right? They were aiming for, you did a six-week sprint, and then paused, and then you six weeks, and then a release, 12 weeks. That was impossible in 1993, or very, very hard, at least very uncommon in large organizations. And so when they're talking about hyper-performing, they're talking about going from years to months, and that was revolutionary. It did change the industry. It happened 20 years ago. right? I'm talking about going from months to weeks to days to hours to minutes. Right? So I've seen these guys build a, a monitoring thing. So they said, OK, we're going to build monitoring. Um, we should start thinking about monitoring, and we're going to have a meeting about monitoring. There's like eight people going to be in this meeting. And Joe's like, don't like meetings. I'm going to use that time differently. I'm going to mock up in HTML what I would like a monitoring dashboard to look like. So he's mocked it up, and it looks pretty good. And it's got some stuff. And he's like, well, actually, it's in HTML. I could just have some JavaScript callbacks that when they receive a message, they could just update stuff in this mocked up UI. Hmm. I, I could attach a WebSocket to that and have a little server. By the time they finished the meeting, Joe would written the monitoring stack. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was only a sketch of a monitoring stack, but it was pretty good. And from there, an entire monitoring team went off and built some pretty good stuff. So this is what I mean. He's, he thinks like that. So, each of these words, I thought this was quite an easy thing to describe. It's patterns of effective delivery. And people go, what do you mean by that? I go, oh, patterns. Patterns is, well, a pattern is a repeatable strategy. And the thing that makes a pattern different from a best practice is that patterns depend on context. A best practice is context free. It says, go do this thing. Your life will be better if you go do this thing. We all know that doesn't exist. But we also all know that it's a pretty good way to get started. Okay? So we all know that when we learn to drive, we feed the wheel through the hands like this, yeah? And because that's how we learn to drive. It's a best practice. Okay? And then we all know that when we drive now, we're like that, and we're leaning over, and the knee, hang on, just changing the... Right? And, and, and then the <laughs> policeman, oh, hang on, hello, feed the wheel, feed the wheel. Um, and so what happens is, Best practices are fantastic for novices, for beginners, to get people out the gate. But then over time, as they gain context, then they're ready for patterns. We tend to give patterns to juniors, to beginners, and they go, oh, that's a best practice, because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for rules. So they go, oh, I shall use this rule. Andy Hunt, one of the uh, pragmatic programmer authors, tells this lovely story. He, did a, he used to run a patterns workshop. And, uh, now, design patterns workshops. They had this book with these 21 design patterns in. And they're not patterns, by the way. Okay? The design patterns book isn't patterns. It's, well, it's idioms for getting by in how crap C++ is as a language. Okay? <laughs> That's what the design patterns book is. So they have a pattern called an iterator. Right? Every other language has, has four. <laughs> well, I mean, C++ has four as well. I don't know why you'd need a pattern for anyway. So lots of those, lots of those patterns are, are, don't exist or aren't problems in other places. But so an actual pattern, it has a name. So patterns originated as, as a, a chap called Christopher Alexander, who's an architect, and he wanted to describe architecture. He wanted non-architects to be able to talk about architecture and talk about designing buildings and public spaces. And he, he figured that there was a pattern language that you could use to describe spaces and, and buildings. And so then a bunch of uh, West Coast hippies in the early 90s went, this looks fantastic. Um, we should, I wonder if there's a pattern language for software. And they were people like Ward Cunningham and Kent Beck and Linda Rising, and so it was some really, really wonderful, wonderful people. And so they started doing this, and then a bunch of jokers released a book called Design Patterns and Killed the Whole Movement, which is a shame. Um, it's still going, there's still, people still talk about patterns. So a pattern has a name, because then we can talk about it. It has some kind of context where it works. More importantly, it should come with a warning thing 
where it doesn't work. If someone can't tell you where something doesn't apply, they don't understand it yet. Or they're selling you something. Or both. Okay? So when someone, you know, so when I talk about these patterns, I say they are neither necessary nor sufficient, they may be useful. I've seen teams try and apply these things wholesale uh, um, and, and like, buy the book and not really thinking about it, and it didn't work for them. I've seen teams doing really well with none of this stuff. So back to Andy Hunt. He's, um, I haven't started my talk yet, by the way. Uh, um, so he's, he's got this class, and he's got these, these 21 design patterns that he's teaching these guys, and one of his students didn't take any breaks. And so during the first break, he's coding away. During lunch, you know, so he eats lunch really quickly, comes back coding away. By the end of like, the second day, Andy's like, what are you doing? He's really concerned about this guy. And he looks, and this guy has managed to get 17 of the design patterns into one piece of code. So we've got nearly there. I've got an iterator flywheel memento collection. What? Right, because clearly more patterns is better. Right? <laughs> and this is what happens when people with no context get hold of a pattern. They use it like a blunt instrument. So Linda Rising has my favorite description of a pattern. She says, if you go up to someone and say, hey, I've got this pattern, and, and it's, it's this really good idea, let me show you it, and they, they show you it, and you go, oh, that's a really good idea, then it's not a pattern, it's a really good idea. Okay? If you go up to someone and you say, hey, I've, I've got this pattern, and it's like this, and they say, oh, I thought everyone did that, then it might be a pattern. Okay, you're naming things that you see. Okay. So, um, effective, then. Effective is interesting, because effective suggests that you have some kind of goal. Effective at what? Okay, this morning I was talking about the idea of effectiveness being about lead time to getting some kind of business impact. Okay, lead time to delivery. I care about lead time. I don't care about making lots of software. I care about getting a result for you quickly. That's my purpose. What are you optimizing for? Are we optimizing for time to market? Are we optimizing for quality? Maybe we're optimizing for learning. Okay, well, let's, let's take a look at what we do. Let's take a look at our behaviors, because our behaviors will tell us what we're optimizing for. Our behaviors are iterations and sprints and time boxes or estimation, planning poker, right? Those are the things that we do. Those are the things that we fill up our days with, that get in the way of doing, I don't know, work, right? And all of those things exist because we're optimizing for predictability. We're optimizing for planning, which is ironic, because that's the thing that we're you know, adapting to change over the thing we spend all our time doing, right? And why? Well, not because we're idiots, because we're smart. Because in the early 90s, when we were coming up with Scrum and XP and Crystal and DSDM and feature-driven development and adaptive and all these other agile methods, most of which some of you have never heard of, um, when we were coming up with those things, that was what was missing. We didn't have predictability. We, we were just, IT was just a, a bin that you poured money into, and then some years later, nothing came out, right? <laughs> And so then you go, oh, this, is, this is dreadful. We need to get a new CIO. A new CIO will come in, go, get rid of all those lot, bring in a new lot, right? Um, so I've seen what they've done wrong. I've figured it out, and we can fix it. It's going to take about three years and cost loads of money. I, what? No. So, okay. So effective then. Um, what are we optimizing for? And when we're optimizing for that, what are we trading off? Again, Molly talked about trade offs in her talks, and, and it's really, really important to understand there is no free lunch. Okay, anything we're doing, we're trading off. So, what I want to do with this talk is show you a number of patterns. Um, there's I think four or five I'm going to try and talk about today. Um, and they cover different areas of software delivery. So, we're going to look at things like uh, architecture, programming, uh, habits of programming, team dynamics, learning, so those kind of things. Okay, so there's lots of patterns from lots of different kinds of things. Um, and then what do we mean by delivery? Yeah? So why do we write software? There's a lovely quote by a chap called Ted, uh, Ted Levitt, Professor Theodore Levitt, Harvard Business School. He says, um, people don't want a quarter-inch drill. They want a quarter-inch hole. Yeah? Go, oh, look at this drill. It's amazing. I designed you this drill. It has all these other... I don't care. I want a hole in a wall. That's what I want. If you can give me a hole in a wall an easier way, I don't need a drill. Yeah, we obsess about the things we build rather than the purpose they're being built for. So we want to focus on the business capability. OK. So does anyone recognize this? Does anyone know what that's from? I'd be very, very impressed if anyone does. Sorry? It's a nautical chart, kind of. Kind of. It's actually turned 90 degrees, yeah. so it fits. 
It's the treasure map from Treasure Island. Isn't that a gorgeous illustration? And free. Um, so what I wanted was some way of laying out these patterns in a way that you could, you could read and it made sense. So I have two axes, effectiveness going across and difficult going up. So effectiveness, how much of a differentiator this will be, how much more effective this will make you, in my completely unscientific, totally biased opinion. And on the up and down axis, how hard it is to get good at this pattern. And just again to reiterate, these are not patterns for beginners. The bottom left, the origin point here is quite hard. <laughs> Okay, the, the, the bottom of the vertical axis is quite hard, and the bottom left of the effectiveness is reasonably effective. Okay, so it goes from quite to very, and reasonably to remarkably. Okay, so then let's take a look at some patterns. Um, first one I want to talk about is a pattern called spike and stabilize. So, um, and just, just to get slightly ahead of myself here, what I'm expecting to happen is during the course of the next, I don't know, half an hour or so, people are going to be tweeting, Dan said it's okay to copy and paste code. And then it's also going to be saying, Dan said it's okay to hack code and put it into production. And the slightly scary thing is I'm going to say both those things. Okay. With caveats. <laughs> right? Which is that sometimes it doesn't work. So, spike and stabilize then. Um, this morning I was talking about a short software half-life, the idea that I want to uh, keep the half-life of my code base short. That means code in it is either very new or it's already very stable. There isn't code that's that kind of awkward middle age between kind of new, new enough that someone knows how it works and, uh, or, or well enough established and documented and tested and all that that everyone knows how it works. There's that awkward code that sits in the middle gap where it's just old enough that we can't quite remember what it does or why it's there, or anyway, the way we're using it has changed over time, and, and if I go in and change this thing, do I have to also change that thing, and where's the dependency over there? Wh why does it even use one of those? And what the hell, who plugged Maven in over here? You know, those kind of things. And, and so Spike and Stabilize is a technique for very deliberately deciding that code is going to go from young to old. That should be a deliberate choice. So in other words, I write code, I start off with uh, code that's new. If it's going to stick around, I have a way of reasoning about it sticking around. So spike and stabilize then. What's a spike? It's like, it's like a question. You can, uh, you can say things now. It's, so it starts with a mock-up, yeah? So what, what, what is a spike? Can anyone tell me what a spike is in, in agile terms? Kent Beck coined this phrase. It's an experiment, okay? Um, it's an experiment in code. So that the metaphor is that you've got a spike and you're just trying to drive a spike through a piece of wood, yeah? So all I care about is just can I get through to the other side? It doesn't matter if splinters fly out and it makes a mess. I can go back and do it properly later. What are the rules with a spike? Time boxed, very good. It's time boxed. What else? I promise I'll throw it away. Scout's honor, any code I generate in a spike gets thrown away. Promise. Right? <laughs> Lots of people are shaking their heads. Oh, you don't keep code, do you? That's very naughty. Right? Um, the point of a spike is to learn something. And so once I've learned that thing, I throw the code away, and then I start again with my test-driven development and my test coverage and my pair programming and all that good things, and then I build production co code. And so building production code is a different type of process than spiking. So I'm a huge fan of real options. So real options is the idea of applying options theory from trading to uh, real life. So in, in trade, so an option in, in, in finance um, is a financial instrument. It's the right but not the obligation to do something in the future. Okay, so I buy an option. It's like buying uh, an insurance policy, if you like. So say I owe you a bunch of euros and I've got a bunch of pounds. Um, I can I can. Well, me, me you know, and, I, and I need to pay you in September. Okay, so come September, uh, the, the pound's really weak against the euro because we've left Europe because we're idiots. And so, if this thing's going on in the UK at the moment, it's not very interesting. It basically involves a load of politicians lying to each other and the public, and it's basically business as usual. But um, <laughs> anyway, so so I, I'm worried that in September I'm going to have to find a load of money and, and pay you in euros. So. Um, so what I can do is I take out an option, and I buy an option. An option means, in this case, is that someone is obliged to sell me euros at a fixed rate, at a rate that we agree. 
So come September, if the pound's really weak, I go, ha-ha, I have this piece of paper that means that you are obliged to sell me euros at this, pay at this rate. If the pound's really strong, I just throw the paper away. I just buy some euros and, and pay my debt. And so, so that's how we use options. So when you look at an option, there's three things you can see about it. The first thing is options have value. Okay, that contract has a value, and the value changes with time. The closer we get to September, if the pound's really weak, this piece of paper is worth a lot of money. If the pound's really strong, it's worthless. Okay, and as the currencies change against each other, this piece of paper is worth different amounts of money. Okay, so it has value. Options expire. So come September, in October, I have a piece of paper that says a month ago I could do a thing. It's pointless. Okay? And so because of those things, the advice, the trading advice is don't commit early, never commit an option early, unless you have a really good reason. Okay? And, and really, this kind of ties in very nicely with the idea of deferring decisions, because you have better information later and that kind of thing. So I think of the choice to make a, something a spike or production code, that's an option. That's a choice. And we make that option right before we have any working code at all. So they go, right, before I touch any code at all, I'm going to choose that this is production code or a spike. That seems odd to me. So spike and stabilize, as a pattern, says this. It says, treat any code as a spike. All code starts out as a spike. All code is an experiment. It doesn't mean we write rubbish. It means we still write good code, but I'm not going to overthink it. The chances are this code is likely to get thrown away. Or I'm going to act as though this code is likely to get thrown away. So I build it, and I build you know, OK code, but there's certain things I'm going to cut corners, and I'm going to do it very deliberately. I'm going to make choices about cutting corners, and the way I cut corners is I go to do. Okay? To do, remove hard-coded password. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Well, it's actually not bad, because I had a chat with the um, security guys, and it's a read-only password that goes into Active Directory and gets a list of users, and I just populate a drop-down with it, and it's just hard-coded in there. And they change it every month anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so remove hard-coded password. So what should I do? Of course, what I should do is I should, um, I should read the password from a file. The file should be write protected and it should be read only for that user. And now I need to remember to deploy the file with the code. And then, so to read the file, I need to open the file, read the password, remove the new line, remember to close the file, probably put that in a finally block because I, uh, admin. Admin is what I'm supposed to do. Okay? It doesn't add anything to the value of the thing. It's just, it's just better practice. It's just better hygiene to have passwords in external places. Yeah? So I put a to-do there that says, yeah, we know. We know, but we want to get this experiment out. And then anyway, so I deploy this thing. And again, so I'm writing code that I'm confident to deploy, but maybe it doesn't have amazing test coverage and isn't brilliantly documented. Again, it's an experiment. Okay? And then, so we run with this code. And then a little bit later, uh, I'm sitting with uh, Gita, and we're, and we're pairing on something, and then we do the review of shame. Okay? So we look through the code, and we look at all the to-dos. Yeah? And, and Gita's like, you, you, what, you left a hard-coded password? And I tell her the story, and she goes, oh, okay, right, I get it. But anyway, what should we do? And so in the time since I wrote that thing, there's been a bunch of people that wanted that list of usernames, and so the, the, the admin guys have now just exposed it as a, as a REST service somewhere. Yeah? So, so I've just replaced all of that stuff with a GET. So one line HTTP GET. That's pretty cool. Yeah? So to fix my to-do in this case, I didn't need to do all that admin I told you about. Aren't I lucky that I didn't? Yeah? And so now we go back and we change the code and we put this thing in there and we get rid of the to-dos. And so some of the to-dos we go through and we go, well, we're never going to bother with that, just to don't. Yeah? Forget it. And so now what we're doing is we're now the second time through pays for the quality. Okay? We're going back to do something in this code, and so we write some tests around the code, and the tests aren't test driving it to say this is what we think it's going to be used for. The tests are uh, characterization tests, Mike Feathers calls them. These are tests that say how we are actually using it, so they work as better documentation. So we write these tests, and it turns out that to write these tests, we need to move the code around a bit. So we've got this like the, the nested kind of if with a while and a little for loop in the middle there. And we want to put, I mean, really, that should have a test. So we pull it out and we probably make, give it its own method name. And, and let's make it its own class. And so as we're writing these tests, we're pulling the code into a shape that looks a lot like it was test driven in the first place. Shh. Tell no one. Right? I call this test driven testing. Right? <laughs> Right? What happens is, and you only get to do this if you've written loads of TDD code. 
Otherwise, you don't have that aesthetic yet. You don't know what that means. If I say it looks like it's test-driven, a bunch of people with loads of TDD experience go, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. So it's going to be fairly small, really clear, consistent naming, uh, single responsibilities, very readable. I, I know what test-driven code looks like. So we move it towards that. So we end up with, you know, and then Gita starts getting a reputation, right? Because what's happening now is people are going, have you noticed that she doesn't write that many tests, but so all of the code that she writes the test around, that ends up being the code that we keep. How does she do that? Right, it, what she's doing is she's firing arrows and then she's painting a target around them. She gets lots of bullseyes, that one. Yeah? And, and, so, and so this is what we do. So it only works if. Spike and stabilize only works if. You promise to stabilize. That's your table stakes. Okay? Spike and stabilize is a high discipline pattern. Otherwise, it's spike, spike, hack, 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 hack. Right? There is nothing sustainable in that. Yeah? So. There's, I have two rules for when I go and stabilize something. The first rule is second time back. So the second time back, if I go back into this code to do something with it, I start writing tests around it, I document it, so we clearly care about this thing, and I'm going to make it do something else now anyway, and so we pay for the cleanup then. And it's probably not much more expensive than if we'd done it properly in the first place. We're just deferring that cost. Okay? Um, the other thing I'll do is I'll set a timer. So I'll say, right, okay, we've written this thing. In six weeks, we're going to come back and review this thing in case I haven't gone back to it. And so that means that code doesn't accidentally get older. Because remember, that's that funny middle zone code that we want to avoid. So I go back, and in six weeks' time, we look at this thing, and go, actually, do you know what? It's just quietly thrumming away and happily working. That's great. So now let's pay down the debt. Let's do what we're supposed to do. And so again, document it, clean it up, write some tests. So over time, we end up with either code that's very recent and spiky, or code that's very stable, well-documented, well-tested. We're deliberately choosing which code gets to survive. Okay? Like I said, these are not patterns for beginners. Because as a beginner, I don't know what constitutes uh, good code. It's not that I'm an idiot. I just don't have that experience yet. It's not an elitist thing. It's just write loads of code. Write loads of code, pair with people who write good code, and get a sense of what good code looks like. It's your 10,000 hours. So, so yeah, so spike and stabilize then is the, the, the governance, if you like, that is the due diligence around being allowed to put this stuff into production. Okay, so let's take a look at another pattern. So this is a hair trigger. So hair trigger is a deliberately, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, it should, be, should make you slightly uneasy. Right? At the same time, hair trigger should make you uneasy, and it should. So a hair trigger, is the ability of a team to deploy its own code, to push its own code into production. That's a hair trigger. Uh, hair trigger, like anything else, right? Hair trigger on a gun, if you have a gun with a hair trigger, it should also have a safety catch. The safety catch should mostly be on. <laughs> this is exactly the same sort of metaphor. So a hair trigger is with great power comes great responsibility, but a team can go very quickly if it can deploy its own code. In fact, let's invert that. If the team can't deploy its own code, it will never be able to go fast. You are putting deliberately an obstacle in its way. And a lot of people, particularly in finance, go, oh, Sarbanes, Oxley, oh, uh, compliance. And it turns out Messrs. Sarbanes and Oxley are actually quite smart people. And Sarbanes, Oxley occurred in the post Enron and, and people doing crazy things and mostly illegal crazy things. And what they said was, we don't want to have any loan operators able to do stuff. That makes sense. Okay? And so you can be Sarbanes-Oxley compliant by having multiple pairs of eyes on a piece of code, by having someone else in the team deploying something that someone else in the team wrote. That's fine. You don't need a, a massive silo in between dev and ops right, to be SOX compliant. That's not a thing. That's a misreading of the thing. So we can have a hair trigger. And with a hair trigger, it means the team can deploy stuff quickly. It means the team can screw up quickly. There, I said it. OK? So <laughs> it means, again, this is about being careful. right? So when you first start cycling, you have the little stabilizer wheels. And that means that you can't hold off. And then as you, go far, you, know, you get better cycling, you can take the little things off, and you can cycle now. And then you decide you want to get the carbon bike with the really thin wheels and go boom, like this. OK? You don't start doing that. Yeah? But you also, you should be able to do that if you feel safe doing that. Okay? So it's a confidence thing, and it's an experience thing, again. So in order for this to work, the team needs to understand the risks, the impact of releasing something. 
And if, as, as we move towards a more componentized world with lots of little pieces, understanding the impact of little pieces. We had, in one trading system I was working on, we had a very, very simple bit of code. And what the simple bit of code did was this. It connected to a, um, a trading exchange, and it said, uh, and it just listened. So there's a fire hose of trading messages. And these trading messages are super simple messages. They basically they have an instrument, like you know, Apple or IBM or something, like the, 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 the thing you're buying. Um, they have a side, so buy or sell, right? So whether you buy a thing or sell a thing. They have an amount and they have a quantity. Sorry, an amount and a price. Yeah, so how many of the thing and how much it costs. That's it. That's a, that's a market data message right there. And so what this thing does is it listens to all these market data messages, this fire hose of you know, thousands of these things a second. And it just keeps them in a map. That's all it does. All it does is keeps them in a map so that at any point I can say, what's the current value of uh, IBM? And it says, oh, it's this. Go, OK, great, thanks. Really simple bit of code. It turns out, though, that a lot of exchanges, if you disconnect from the exchange and then connect again, you don't know what's going on, and it won't tell you. Some exchanges will, will give you a snapshot. You can catch up. Some of them don't. What that meant was with this bit of code, if you disconnected from the exchange during the day, you were basically done trading for the day. You couldn't now reconnect. There's no point reconnecting because you don't know what the market looks like, so you can't trade. And so that meant this really simple, obvious-looking bit of code. If you happened to deploy it during the day, you just killed a day's trading. Awkward. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah? And so <laughs> the team needed to know that that bit of code you just don't deploy during the day. And that's a hard thing to remember when there's lots and lots of bits of code. And so we put a safety catch on that hair trigger. If you tried to deploy that, it said, bah, are you aware that? Da -da 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 -da. Um, and because we only had a few of those, it didn't read like a ULA. Yes, of course. Right, so all, all end-user license agreements should have a whatever button. Yeah, so, yeah, whatever. whatever I, I don't care. Yeah, I'm just going to press, I'm going to press OK. I'm a liar. I'm a liar. I haven't read your, I haven't read it, but you can't prove it. OK. So, um, so w because we had very few of these actual warning warnings, people would read them. So it goes, ah, you're about to release this thing, and it has those implications, and you're like, oh, <laughs> glad I didn't. <laughs> That'd be really stupid. Or you go, yeah, I know, but we have to try this thing out. OK. So, um, it means the safety catch is off, OK? So it means be careful. So, and again, so you see there's patterns for... Uh, so spike and stabilize is a programming pattern. It's a pattern of behavior of programmers. Hair trigger is a deployment operations pattern. OK. Um, this is one of my favorite patterns, ginger cake. So this is a story I heard, and I thought I heard it from one of the pragmatic programmers at a conference many years ago, and I've asked them both, and they both said, no, it wasn't me. So I've no idea whose story this is. I'm going to tell you, but it's someone's story. And the story goes like this. It's about the Dreyfus model. There's a question. Oh, sorry, I'm speaking very quickly. OK, I do this. I'm, 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 I'm English, and I speak quickly. Yes, I can slow down a bit. OK, thank you. So useful feedback. So. If I'm, if I'm still speaking too quickly, you must tell me. OK. So the story is this, is a, a lady who's an expert baker. Um, and so as an expert baker, she just kind of, she thinks in patterns now. Right? She doesn't think in rules anymore. She thinks in solutions. And so she has this wonderful, she has a, an index, a little box full of index card recipes. And she reads these, and these recipes, so this is her recipe for a chocolate cake. This is, this is a real recipe for a chocolate cake that I found on the internet. So please go and make this cake and tell me if it tastes nice. Okay? So it's, a, it's a real chocolate cake. And so you mix the ingredients together. And this is, you know, it says this in her. And then a little bit later in the same box, there's a card for ginger cake. And the ginger cake recipe looks like this. Like chocolate cake, but with ginger. Okay. Hmm. That, there's a lot hidden in that, because ginger and chocolate aren't like each other at all. Chocolate is solid at room temperature, it then goes melty, it then burns if you heat it. Ginger is squishy at room temperature, it's squishy when you heat it, and it's squishy when you... <laughs> it's just squishy, right? Uh, it, it has a different... It, it interacts with flour in a different way. It couldn't be less like chocolate, right? It says, like, ginger, like chocolate cake, but with ginger. But she knows what she means. She's done enough baking with, well, she is probably her own chocolate cake recipe, is the first thing. It's also, um, uh, she un she's done enough baking with both chocolate and ginger to understand how those things are different. So what? So this, pr this uh, pattern is a pattern for getting started quickly with something. 
Um, and where I saw this, again, this was in this small team. I'm working with someone else now, a chap called Neil. And Neil sits down next to me, and we're going to build a new little web component just like another little web component. So I'm looking at this component we've already got, and I'm thinking, well, probably what we should do is you know, take out the bit that's in common, factor it, make it a little library, and, uh, and, then, we've, you know, and then create this new thing. And I think that's what, that's what Neil's going to do. So Neil sits down, Control-A, Control-C, Control-V. Select all, copy, paste. And I just went, ah, that's illegal. They threw you out the softwares for that, right? And, and, and he's, just co he's just copied and pasted a, load, a whole thing into a new file. And then he changes the name of it. And then he just starts deleting like crazy. And he goes like this. And then he starts. And I just thought, what, what did you? And, and then I realized something. OK. He got started with this new thing way faster than I would have. We got to something working way faster than I would have. He was only able to do that because he was really, really intimate with that other piece of code. Right? He'd written most of it. Yeah? So Ginger Cake is about using existing code, copying existing stuff in order to get out the gate quickly. Again, see, this is me telling you to copy and paste code. Oh, no. Right? So where do you use this? You use this, you only use this if you know that code intimately. Getting something off the internet, copying and dumping a bunch of stuff out of Stack Overflow is not a ginger cake. That is like just making a recipe you found on the internet and thinking it's going to be fine. Don't, don't, don't do that. It's like, that's like piping stuff into sudo bash, right? No one here does that, do they? No, that's very, yeah, because otherwise, otherwise the bash fairies come and sort you out. No, the, you, the, the, you get the sudo warning, and then you end up on Santa's naughty list. That's what happens. So, yeah, so Ginger Cake then says, OK, copy and paste only stuff you know intimately. And there's kind of two variants, if you like, of Ginger Cake. There's a structural Ginger Cake and a behavioral Ginger Cake. So structural Ginger Cake is I've got something that's the same shape as something I've done before. So I just copy all the shape and pull out all the guts. OK? Behavioral Ginger Cake is the other thing, is I copy the behavior of something I've done before and just change some of the pieces. OK? This is the opposite of dry. OK? Dry, don't repeat yourself. And we all think of dry. Dry is a good thing, right? Dry is a part of solid um, and, and clean code and all that stuff. We should be drying code out. We should be removing duplication. The problem is that dry has a dark side. The dark side of dry is coupling. As soon as I introduce as soon as I introduce an abstraction, as soon as I pull out a library and I share it between two components, because reuse, I've just coupled those two components together. I now cannot independently reason about one of those components without having to think about the implications on the other one. Once there are several things using that library, I can't reason about it. And also, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know who might be using the library that I don't know about. Okay? So there's risks. right? Dry has trade-offs. Dry isn't a best practice. Dry is a pattern. Dry is an approach which has positives, reducing duplication, negatives, increasing coupling. Where I have small components, I want to have independence of those components. I don't mind having duplication across components. I mind having duplication within a component. That's, that's probably not great. But having duplication across components is fine. I had, I, do, I was writing a Python app. I was doing a, a Heroku ripoff a few years ago for a, for a company I was working at one of our internal little deployment thing. And there was a bit of code that was the Heroku that was like the master thing that you interacted with, and it ran jobs for you. And then there were all the little agents that would, that would run the apps. And I had the same bit of code in, in the master thing and in the agent things, and it opened files and did stuff with files. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not factor it into a module. I'm not going to factor it into a library. Instead, I'm just going to see what happens with these two things. And it turned out that the thing that was the master cared a lot about security. And the thing that was the agent cared a lot about having lots of files. And so these two bits of code that started out looking quite similar ended up evolving in very different directions. And if I'd had a single thing and I was trying to do both of those with this single thing, it would have been really ugly and really complicated and wouldn't have done either of them well. And so what happens is you have different forces acting on the software. Uh, um, and sorry, my suddenly aware that I'm running out of time, so I'm, the, I, I'm afraid I may need to speak a little quickly again. I do apologize. Uh, um, yeah, and so they're evolved in different directions. They have different forces acting on them, and so they're going to develop differently. Uh, um, so be aware that it's OK sometimes. Again, not for beginners. Copying and pasting code is fine. It's kind of sometimes fine with certain very, very specific constraints. 
Let's look at another one. Shallow silos. This is, this is a team pattern. And the point of this isn't go do this. It's just to kind of illustrate that a lot of choices that look like binary choices in software development aren't. They're more like a scale. So we think about silos, and we think about cross-functional teams, and that's basically your two choices. Okay? Silo development, bad. Cross-functional teams, good. Okay? There's a massive spectrum of options. So one of the things that we found in this team, once we got to about six, six people, we typically had, there were a couple of people who were really into the trading logic, and a couple of people who were really good at you know, UI stuff and web stuff, and a couple of people who were really good at kind of all the glue and connecting things up. And I'm one of the glue people. I love connecting things together. Not that excited about trading and rubbish at web. So I was, I was there. And you know, the, the, the agile rules, if you like, would tell you that we do you know, pair rotation and promiscuous pairing, and everyone does everything and all that stuff. It turns out that that really sucked for a bunch of people in the team. We didn't like doing that. But also, what we didn't want to do is drift. So we had what we called shallow silos, which is like, so maybe two people will work on the same thing for a few weeks or even a few months, right? And another couple will work on something else. And that's fine. They're doing things they enjoy. They're excelling at those things. The product's becoming really good. But we had a shared stand-up every day. We'd have a stand-up maybe twice a day. And once in the morning, it's a tech thing. And once in the afternoon, it's a, it's a, it's a business kind of what have we built. And, and so we'd just step out of our little silo, because it was only a very shallow silo, and then we'd have our team stand up, and then we'd step back into our little silo, and we'd carry on working. Yeah? So working in that way, for us, worked out really well. And so the point of patterns like shallow silos is to suggest there are other ways of, of organizing a team. It's not everything or silos. Yeah? You can, there's lots and lots of options. As Molly was saying earlier, try things, see what works for you, be prepared to experiment, be prepared to throw some of the stuff away if it's not working. And then um, there was, uh, I think there's one more I wanted to talk about. So burn the ships. So burn the ships is um, ah, it's a lovely. So, so, so you know this story about the um, the Spanish explorer whose name I can't remember. Um, but he went off. He, he discovered South America, and it was all very exciting. And um, uh, and and and, he, and he's like he's got all these guys, and there's some some fairly angry South Americans <laughs> waiting there, Incas or whatever, not Incas. Um, and they're, they're, they're quite cross that these guys have just rocked up and are clearly planning to steal all their land. And, and, so, and so he said, OK, right, what are we going to do? And they all went, well, we've got some ships. <laughs> we could go home. And he said, right, burn the ships. Actually, he said, scuttle the ships. He said, sink the ships, but it's not as good of a story. Yeah? He said, burn the ships. So he burns all the ships. What does that do? That means you now no longer have any options. OK? With either forwards or swim. <laughs> and so what do they do? They go forwards, they conquer the land, the rest is uh, American history, so, or South American history. So, um, so burn the ships, then, is a learning pattern. I'm not very good at this, but I've, I've been working with people who are. It's a thing I practice. So again, I, I'm not good at all these patterns, some of these patterns. So I think this pattern is very, very effective. It's really quite difficult. Okay? So burn the ships is a learning pattern. When I learn a new language, um, or new technology, what do I do? I probably download it, I install it, I maybe look at some blogs and some tutorials, and I make little toy apps in it until I kind of feel comfortable, and, and then I maybe start doing stuff with it. That's certainly what I did with Go, and that's what I've been doing with... I'm looking at Rust at the moment. Rust's pretty cool. Um, so Joe doesn't do this, my buddy Joe. What he does is this, is he puts himself on the hook for something. As of, well, I'm going to build this thing um, by this date using this technology. Right, go. <laughs> and so now he's got to go and learn that technology. However, what it does is it means that he only needs to know enough of it to solve this problem. So I also call it indirect learning. I'm, I'm solving this thing in order to learn that thing. So he doesn't look at tutorials and blah and whatever else. He's like, the next thing I need to do is this. How do I do this in this language? How do I do this in this technology? So he did this. He was a very early adopter of Node. And, and he's looking, no, there's nothing out there on the Institute about no. So he just played. He just played with it until it did the thing he wanted it to do. And he built some really useful, critical infrastructure in it. That I'm like, I'm like that's your bonkers, right? You're setting yourself this really hard challenge. But what it did is it meant that he now had a specific goal. Ellie Goldratt in the goal, at the end of the goal, um, there's a lovely interview with him. And he says, one of the questions, um, and Bjarta was talking about this this morning as well, actually, about adoption. He says, um, how, how long does it take companies to adopt 
like, uh, theory of constraints, uh, lean operations. He says it's, 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 it clearly works, it's brilliant. Why, don't people, why aren't more people doing it? And he says, on average, it takes between five and 15 years for an organization to adopt a full paradigm shift, as in a different model of working, a different mindset for working, particularly at a management level, right? Five and 15 years. And he says, because you need three things to happen. You need some kind of downward pressure, like some uh, deadline, some immovable deadline. You need to have run out of options, You need to, because people will do anything before they'll shift their paradigm. Yeah, they'll cling on to, yeah. And the third thing you need is information. He says, I'm good for the third one. So what I do is I make friends with companies, and then I wait. And eventually, the sky comes crashing down, and they go, hey, Ellie, that thing you were talking about. And I go, yeah, theory of constraints. Yeah, let's try it now. Yeah. So what Joe does, what Burn the Ships does, is it, you create those first two artificially. You give yourself a deadline, you choose to have no other options, and now you just need the information. So it's a fantastic model for learning something very targeted very quickly. Like I say, I struggle with doing this. I tend to, I, I, I get easily distracted. So I'm just going to really focus on this. Oh, shiny, look, tutorials. Ooh. So I, it's, it takes a, a lot of discipline. Um, so yeah, so there's a few more of these. <laughs> um, <laughs> haven't got time to go through them today. Um, I've actually got a book up on LeanPub. Uh, called Software Faster, so leanpub.com slash softwarefaster, which I'm writing very slowly. Um, and I keep telling people I'm writing it very slowly because it puts me under more pressure to then write it less slowly. So I've got all of the patterns are outlined there, but I'm filling in the chapters one at a time kind of thing. So anyway, um, I guess the thought I want to leave you with, the question I want to leave you with is this, is given what you're doing day to day, given how you work, what are you optimizing for? What's the thing that matters to you? What's the goal of your system of work? And is it the goal you want it to be? So, thank you very much. Do we have? Um, so, again, Erich Gamma gave a talk here earlier today. Did you have a chance to talk to him and tell him how he ruined the meaning of patterns for you? Of pedants? Patterns. Oh, patterns. patterns. Yeah, well, now you see, he's Eric Gamma. <laughs> and he's, he's, he's done some really, really, really cool stuff, so I'll forgive him that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, so, so it, I mean, it is, it is interesting, though, that we as an industry lost sight of what the patterns movement was trying to do. There are some very, very interesting people still doing patterns. There are still patterns workshops, still patterns uh, conferences. Um, and, and in fact, what's, what, what, what I've seen as well is that the patterns movement has moved into different spaces. So a lot of these patterns aren't software development patterns, they're team organizational patterns, they're deployment patterns, they're, they're, they're software architecture patterns. Um, Linda Rising is one of my heroes. She's written a fantastic book called um, Fearless Change. Okay, Fearless Change is a pattern book for organizational change. It's a pattern language for organizational change. And she, I mean, she gets patterns. She's a deep, deep thinker in patterns. So any, look up Linda Rice, she's amazing. Um, yeah, Eric, Eric Gamma, I mean, you know, if you're going to have a go at Eric Gamma, it's got to be Eclipse rather than patterns, surely, right? So, <laughs> oh, oh, there I go with my out loud voice again. Um, no, and, and again, you know, people, it's easy to beat up on Eclipse and whatever else. As a foundation, as a movement, so, you know, the idea of breaking something out of IBM and turning it into this open source foundation was amazing. Incredibly hard thing to do, incredibly courageous thing to do. So, yeah, so I've got uh, mad props to Eric Gamma, and I'll, I'll, I'll let him off patterns. Okay, why the name Hair Trigger? Why the name Hair Trigger? Because I want it to sound dangerous. I want you to be aware that you have direct line from your keyboard to production, and to be aware that that comes with a responsibility. Okay, so again, I've, I've been thinking about the names very much. Oh, what, what, what is a Hair Trigger? Oh, sorry, what is a Hair Trigger? So what is a hair trigger? It's a type of trigger mechanism on a gun that means that you, can, you barely need to touch the gun and it will fire. Okay? So it means that you can fire much more quickly. It, um, it also makes it a lot more dangerous. Right? And so again, it's, it's, it's only things for grown-ups. Yeah? And by the same token, the, the reason the metaphor is the gun metaphor is again that you can talk about things like safety catches, you can talk about things like drills, you can talk about things like um, 
uh, training that you need in order to be able to you know, have access to these things. So it's, 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 it's it, again, I, I've been very careful with some of the naming, and the names evolve. You know, the name, a lot of these names have changed over time. So I've been teaching this class, Software Faster, for four years now. And one of the reasons I do it is it's basically field research. So I'm learning all the time from people in the room, which is great fun. Any more? I think we might be out of time. Oh, one, what, one quick question. OK. One, one new question came in. Uh, how to sell the stabilized part of Spike and stabilize to management? How to sell the, st the stabilized part of Spike and stabilize to management? It's probably more how to sell the Spike part. <laughs> but um, no, so, so uh, my, the, exp the, the, the context I was developing these patterns names in, if you like, and doing this work in, was trading. And the great thing about trading is you're working with traders. And traders understand risk. Their business is risk. Their business isn't trading. Right? Really good traders understand risk and happen to do trading. Yeah? So what that means is when we talk about risk and options, we're saying, OK, we are going to realize the value of this software sooner. OK, that's the, that's the payoff. Um, and the cost for that is that we will end up having to pay, this down, pay, pay, pay back that, that, that um, governance, that due diligence later. And they say, that sounds like a great trade-off to me. Because that's the job, is to understand what trade I'm going I'm to invest in this, I'm not going to invest in this, I'm going to put money over here and not here. So we say, you can have this thing sooner, and it will cost us later if we choose to keep it. And that's a pretty straightforward idea. It's a pretty easy thing for someone to get. Uh, the problem is when you get into a culture where it's features, 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 features. Right? And so where you have, I mean, Scrum is toxic for this, where you have this, you know, you create this product owner person whose job is to just demand features, which A, absolves the team of any product thinking, which is dreadful. And, and again, you can see where this came from. In the 90s, we were just putting new teams together in silos, from, you know, in cross-functional teams. They'd never worked in cross-functional teams before. They didn't know what that looked like. And they didn't really understand how to think in product. Like a programmer just turns requirements into code, and a tester turns code into bug reports. Right? No one really knew, was thinking about a product. So having someone to coach the team on product made perfect sense. Play it forward 20 years, and it's a completely anachronistic idea. It's bonkers. Most people in most teams understand what it is they're building. So anyway, I got off into a rant there, but yes. So. That's it, no questions. Uh, cool, well, thank you no, very much. Oh. Sorry, just uh, refreshed and... <laughs> oh, hang on. We, we, might, we might be a minute over time, so... Let's say it's the last one. Very last question. Um, I'll answer it quickly. Let it be yes or no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is this only for senior-only teams or also for junior developers? No. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, interestingly, so when we first had this team, and this is like a one-minute story, when we first had this team, it was very experienced, you know, minimum like 15 ish years. And it wasn't a constraint, it was a requirement. It was just that the team happened to have people in it who had been around building software a long time. About six, eight months in, maybe a year in, um, we hired two graduates. We took on two, two fresh graduates. Um, and I was thinking they're going to really struggle with some of this stuff, right? I, or, or at least I was kind of concerned that they might struggle with some of this stuff. They totally got it. They totally got it because it actually make a lot, makes a lot of sense, right? And they're pairing with developers and they're pairing with people in the team so because that's just how we roll. And so they had a lot of mentoring and a lot of stewardship and all that kind of stuff, and they got it. And the reason they got it is because they didn't have any bad habits to unlearn yet. Yeah? <laughs> and so they just knew that, I mean, you'd be an idiot to write something, spike it, put it into production, and not go back and check on it. Surely that's just a really dumb thing to do. <laughs> and and that's, so they just learnt those habits. Unfortunately, of course, we've now ruined them for working anywhere else. <laughs> Why are you writing all these tests right now? You haven't even decided, what, shut up and write a test. Oh, OK, stupid. You know, so, but yes, yeah, so, so, um, so, so, so fresh, new, shiny people can get it. Um, experienced people can get it. What I found is people in the middle really struggle to unlearn the stuff that they've been carrying with them for decades, or at least you know, a bunch of years, in order to relearn some, some habits to go faster. That's definitely us out of time, so thank you very much indeed.